Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Smack Talk RC. We're here in Orlando, Florida at the Torches Field and today we're going to talk about an interesting subject. A lot of questions come from all over the place, all over the world about this particular type of helicopter. And uh, I have two experts with me. I have Kerry Shirley. He's a good friend of mine for a few years. He's the treasurer of our club here in Orlando, Florida. He has a lot of experience with this type of helicopter. And we have nonetheless the the guy here by the nickname of Toxic Al, Alan Gement, he uh, works for TRM Power and uh, he's very knowledgeable about these products. So if you guys take a guess, we're going to talk about gas-powered helicopters. We're going to give you all kinds of tips. We're going to talk about what they're capable of doing, uh, what's the best way to approach uh, getting into gassers, uh, whether you need to go with a brand new kit or you can do a conversion, different types of gas engines. Uh, we're going to talk to Al about uh, how to do the uh, modifications to these engines. He's going to explain why we need to modify the engines. Um, we have all kinds of tips. We're going to give you tips on tuning. We're going to show you how they perform, how they compare against their counterparts and, and, and other things. So it's going to be definitely a very interesting episode. Uh, we're going to get right to it. So this is number 19 uh, everything about gas helicopters Okay, we're going to start talking about the basics of gas helicopters. Um, a lot of questions about gas helicopters and, you know, I would assume that if you guys are just as ignorant as I am when it comes to gas helicopters, we're going to start from the very beginning. So, um, again, I have the experts here and let's start talking and I guess I could, either one of you, it could be Carrie or it could be Alan, I mean, you guys could chime in. Let's talk a little bit about how, you know, what what is basically what is a gas helicopter of course it's it's a it's an RC helicopter that is powered by a gas engine uh, typically what what are the engines that people put on these things just we're gonna get into detail about the engines and stuff but just a brief overview of you know the types of engine is it uh, is it a <laughs> wheat eater engine or basically, what is it it's Zenoa Kamatsu uh, produces implement products uh, such as wheat eaters lawn trimmers and they have a hobby market uh, it is basically a retrofitted uh, weed eater of sorts, uh, specifically modified by them for this application. Uh, there's two different versions that they, they're utilizing right now. Um, one which was never really intended for this, uh, which is the RC-based platform, uh, which is a, and we'll get into that later, and yeah. the other is the PUH, which is what everybody probably knows, uh, which what is... What does PUH stand for? PUH stands for... Um, God, you had to ask. Um, power, unit power unit helicopter. That's there it. you go. And they have with all the, there's three versions: PUH, PUM, and PU. Uh, PU is power unit, and then they have power unit marine, which is basically the same engine. There is really no difference between the three versions, other than uh, one has a different ignition coil, carburetors, and one's water cooled. Cool. What about uh, the history of this stuff? When do you know when they started? Like what? What was the first gas helicopter? Maybe not accurately, you could probably, well, you might be able to say it accurately, or, or the first one you saw, because you've been, the, the, how long have you been doing this for? I've been in uh, model helicopters for 35 years. Oh yeah, yeah, you saw the first gas helicopter. Yeah. Now you can talk. And, I, and I've been uh, dealing with gas, gasoline based for over 15 years. As best I can tell, the first gasoline powered helicopter was built by a guy named Dave Gray, who worked with Dubro. You may remember the Dubro Shark. The original Shark was powered by an Olsen and Rice or O&R motor, 
which if you look at the marketing materials, which I have, their big claim to fame was it made one whole horsepower. Oh, wow. And the, the problem was the helicopter was made entirely of aluminum and steel. The gears and everything were solid steel. So it was very heavy, powered by a one horsepower motor. It was also fixed pitch. Uh, and there were no gyros. So if you wanted to slow the tail down, you had to attach a, a large round disc to catch the air. It, I had one, it was very difficult to fly, uh, and <laughs> it, it was so unsuccessful that they later powered it with an OS Max, and that did get some traction. Did it, um, what size blades was it using? Was it like a 90 size, or like, well, the, there were 90 sizes back then, but. The, the model was about the size of a 90, but the blades were more like 600 size. They were solid wood, and you had to basically put them together yourself and either cover or paint them. So why have, it, it, there is this, I guess you could say misconception, I guess, that these things are very challenging and very complicated, and I believe that has a lot to do with the reason as to why a large percentage of the RC helicopter population has not really ventured into gassers. It seems to be a relatively sm small niche within another niche. Why, why is that? Why, why are people basically saying that there's so many challenges? Have there been challenges? And how has this sort of evolved in recent times? Well, traditionally, um, they're based on standard helicopters. And I say traditionally, even today, they largely are. And because of that, they tended to overheat, they tended to be too heavy, and they had operational challenges. They're a little different to tune. Uh, they've been difficult to keep cool and there have often been clutch problems with them. Uh, and most of that is because the manufacturers have never really focused on let's build a pure gas-based model. Now that's changed in recent times, but historically what you see is the manufacturers took their GLOW model, they made a few changes so the motor would fit. You had a traditional motor that was, like Al said, focused on uh, yard implements. It hadn't been modified to turn faster or run smooth at high RPMs. So you kind of got the worst of, of all worlds. You got a model that weighed about like an electric, but had less power than a glow model. And it was challenging to tune because most people you know, don't have any experience with it. And it is different. If you have tuned a glow model, you can learn to tune a gasoline model. It's a little different, but it's the same idea. There's two needles, it's got a carburetor. Gotcha. So. Basically, people think that these things are super complicated or whatever, but like you said, there's there's a few factors that have played a role in, uh, as to why um, these models have never really become that They're popular. Just They're, They're just different. And what, just to touch on what he said real quick, the tuning aspect has been the hardest thing for a lot of guys to get around. Um, I'm going to just throw something quick at you. Gasoline burns at roughly about 19,000 uh, 19, BTUs. Alcohol, nitro, around 11,000. It's a lot colder burning fuel. We run a lot less oil to, to, to fuel mix than the nitro guys do. Yeah. And because of that, if you go up and you lean out your nitro, what do you do? You bring it down, you go ahead and rich it up, and you go back up. The problem is, is you're burning so much heat, you get so much more heat uh, out of the exhaust and not enough lubricant. If you're off on the tuning and you go too lean, um, you can only do that a couple of times before you start to hurt things. And yeah. most guys will go, I got oh, more power, more power, and they'll start tuning in, and they like they find the sweet spot, which what they think is, but they've gone too lean, and now they've burned the motor. Yeah, don't tell me about it. I know that for a fact. People, when people don't have the power, they think that the only way to get the power is by turning the needle clockwise. They don't realize that a lean engine puts out far less power than a filthy rich engine. So, Agreed. And, and we're going to talk into the oh, yeah. tuning as well, but um, I guess that covers it for the basics of uh, gas helicopters, and uh, we're just going to continue on and move on to the next segment. All right, this segment is going to be on, on the motors in uh, gasoline-powered helicopters. Let's start off by comparing what you'd find in a normal glow motor or glow powered helicopter. This is your basic YS91. Uh, I'm sure many of you have seen it. It uh, tends to be cooled with a fan that looks something like this and with a cooling shroud that looks something like this. Um, what's different about gasoline helicopters is they're powered by gasoline motors. Here's an example of a couple of them that Al mentioned earlier, the PUH format in the RC format, 
Uh, there, there are a number of differences between them, which Alan can talk about in, in particular. Another thing I want to show you is what you might find is a typical clutch. This is a T-Rex 700 clutch. This is a clutch out of the new Whiplash gas model. You can see there's quite a bit of difference in engagement area. We talked about in the last segment some of the operational problems, cooling and, and clutch engagement. You're going to see through this segment how that, that's changed. All right, basically we t touched off on the differences between the two motors that we're primarily going to use, and this being the PUH and this being the RC-based platform. Where the, the PUH was primarily built for a purpose, this was not. This was a more roundabout style motor. It came out of the go-ped market, uh, then into the RC car market, and it's found its way into the helicopter market. It has a total different con you know, complexity to it than the, than the PUH does. The PUH motor, which we have right here, is a very small compact engine. It's been around for a long time. You guys remember the old G2Ds, then it came to the G23, and now its, form its format has changed up into the 26, uh, as well as the 231. Uh, it uses a smaller flywheel, a two-coil uh, two magnet uh, magneto, meaning this is your magneto, and then you have a standard coil, which goes to your spark plug. The RC motor is a totally different scenario. This is your flywheel. This is also your cooling fan, and, and if Carrie can show you, you got quite a bit more cooling capacity, two sets of fins, so it pulls air from both sides, uh, and it's a much, much more better inertia uh, style flywheel. I'll explain that in a minute. This particular engine uh, has a different crankshaft. It has no other parts that are similar other than the piston and carburetor. Everything else is different. Uh, this has become a real big hit and since a lot of the manufacturers are starting to realize that this is Vario, you guys know who Vario has been using them. Um, who, what was the... Hellybug was the first conversion Heli to, to was really the first this motor. And now you're starting to see uh, miniature aircraft is taking notice of it and uh, producing it for the new whiplash. One of the advantages of this engine is it has, it has the ability to rev without creating vibration. And vibration and heat are the two big things that we have to deal with as tuners. Um, vibration being the key thing. You, guys, you know this. Vibration kills your servos. It causes all, all sorts of problems with the helicopter, and we don't need that. So this motor will have the ability to turn higher RPMs smoother than the PUH. Not saying that this is a bad engine by any means. This has been the bread and butter for a very, very long time. It's just a slightly different you know, application. Sorry. There are differences, this is different sizes that uh, we're going to talk about. The, pre the first motor that came out again was the 231, or actually the 23, which is a 22.5 cc engine. It uses a 32 millimeter bore and a 28 millimeter stroke. They came out with the 26, which is the 260, uh, which is a 34 millimeter bore over 20, uh, 28 millimeter stroke. They do the same in the applications of the RC. The original 230 and 260 are the same bore and stroke combinations. The new 270 and 240 give a lot of people thinking that they're bigger engines. I'm just going to tell you straight up, if you buy a 270 thinking it's a 27cc engine, you're going to be disappointed. It is still a 26cc motor, or technically it's 25.4, round it up. The difference is, is this platform uses a 4-bolt cylinder head versus the original 2-bolt. And the same thing with the 240. It's a 230 with a 4-bolt cylinder head. They even make a 290 now, which is a 36 millimeter bore, and through aftermarket uh, manufacturing, you can get a stroke of crank and make it up to a 30.5 cc engine. Depending on what style of flying you're doing, what type of helicopter you're using it in, will determine what cc displacements are best going to suit your flying style. Earlier I talked about operational issues with, uh, with gas engines and those were, have primarily been driven by the way the manufacturers have made the models. Uh, with the introduction of, of these better cooling motors, and again Alan talked about the, the, the difference in, in cooling, I mean it's, it's tremendous. The amount of air that's moving across this cylinder is, is incomparable as to what's, what's generally found with these. So you can run the motor with a higher performance configuration, you can turn them faster, which means you're changing the performance profile of your helicopter. Um, another piece of this that's traditionally been a problem is, in the older style, the motors were turned slower, typically in the 10 to 12,000 RPM range. 
uh, and as a result of that, the original clutches like this, these are designed to run 16, 18,000 RPM, so they don't engage properly. Uh, two things have changed. As I said, if you look at the whiplash, it's got a much larger clutch. Uh, they won't have that same issue. And at the same time, the motors are moving to a higher performance window. Uh, the, the tuned motors that you would find in a whiplash or in some of the other models you see around you are, are set to operate in the 13 to 16,000 RPM range. So several things are happening at once. You're getting a better cooling system, you get a better clutch, plus you're turning the motor faster, which is a better profile for a model helicopter, particularly if you're trying to do 3D type uh, maneuvering where you need a high, high head speed and you need um, uh, plenty of power transfer to the drivetrain. Primarily, there are a few different pipes out there. Uh, you have your can muffler, which is a stock muffler that comes with the Zenoa motor. They do a good job as far as uh, keeping the power where it needs to be, but they're very, very loud. Uh, not really a muffler per se, but uh, again, it's something that cuts the noise down. Then you'll have the, the mufflers that come from the manufacturers of the helicopters, uh, Century, uh, Bergen, uh, to name a few, RJX, uh, and then you have the Hattori's. The, primarily, they're all designed to do one thing, and that's to cut the noise. Performance has been a secondary market for them. While they do have benefits, uh, it's personal preference to, to noise, but I will, I will preface uh, what I'm about to say that, you know, it's a personal preference of what you like, but there can be adverse effects on certain mufflers as far as overall performance. One of the things that we've been finding out is that some of the inherent vibrations that we're getting in, in some of these helicopters are not caused by the motors themselves or, or balancing or any of that. Is because the mufflers themselves are restrictive. Uh, and when they become restrictive, too much back pressure, it causes a vibration. Um, that's easy enough to find out if you do enough research, talk to the right people, find out what's working uh, on that particular uh, you know, setup. Ask me. If you come to me and say, Alan, I'm building this helicopter, this is the motor I want to use, what, what do you recommend? And I'll give them options on what they're going to be able to use. And the other option, um, which is not widely talked about, uh, is the actual tune pipe. Uh, or expansion chamber as it's been, been also noted as. That is a performance pipe. It is designed to do one thing and one thing only. Produce horsepower. Uh, up to 20% of the engine's power comes from a really good tune pipe. The problem is, is they tend to be bulky, long, uh, and they also have a tendency to be loud. Uh, years ago I introduced one as a prototype uh, for miniature aircraft and everybody called it the baseball bat because it went all the way down the back of the boom. Uh, made great horsepower, but it also has its drawbacks. It's extra weight, it's not as quiet, so most guys who deal with the helicopters want the noise down, so that's not exactly going to be your, your number one uh, seller, so to speak. Alright, let's talk about fuel. Uh, these are obviously gasoline-powered helicopters, so they run on gasoline, um, which and they run quite well on it. However, if you're like me, you keep your model in your house, they tend to smell your house up. The, the blends that you find today in gasoline have ethanol in them, they have a lot of other additives. They don't smell very good. There is an alternative. Uh, it's called lantern fuel or camper fuel. Uh, this became popular several years ago. This is just your basic Coleman camper fuel. It is a naphtha-based product. Uh, it's um, runs just the same as gasoline. The big difference is it doesn't smell. It makes your, it makes your model smell like you're cooking dinner, basically. So no difference in performance? Yeah, you can get, it, it depends on how it's tuned. Uh, gasoline, again, is a purpose-built fuel for what it's what these engines are designed for. Uh, octane levels are different between between the two. Much uh, lower. Much lower on the Coleman. It does, you know, it came to my t attention years ago. Uh, John Garz was the first one to talk to me about it, and me being a diehard gas guy, I'm like, no, you don't run that stuff in my engines. And he goes, well, I've been running it for a while now. I said, well, how does it run? He goes, it runs great. All right, I'll have to try this. You know, I got to keep an open mind because I know a lot of guys are going to want to do it. I'm running it now too. I keep my helicopters in my bedroom. My wife has no idea I got fuel on them, um, and I like to keep it that way. Um, so, I mean, the, the fuel itself uh, does have some advantages and disadvantages. They both are going to have pluses or minuses. 
but realistically, the overall pluses on the Coleman way out, how far away the, the negatives. Uh, fuel mixture. E oil. Either way, you're going to want to mix them with oil, and it's it's basically a, a yard implement motor. So most of the two-stroke pre-mix oils will work. Uh, there, there are several that have become popular over time. One of the most popular is a product made by Amsoil. Uh, this is a 100 to 1 premix. Very few people ever run it at 100 to 1. Do not do that. It tends to run at 50 to 1 or in the 40s range. I've run uh, you know, standard stuff like still synthetics. The oil I'm running right now is this Honda HP2. It's an all synthetic. There are, all, there are a lot of oils on the market. If you look on the forums, you'll find different people using different oils. You know, the, the bottom line here is, I think we fret a little bit too much about oil. The, big, the most important part is to get a ratio that's reasonable for the kind of, for kind of flying you're doing, the kind of performance you're getting out of the model. Let me interject something about that. Um, everybody's got their preferences. My, my biggest thing is whatever works for you and it's consistent, use it. S stick with it though. Don't don't be switching around all the time. But oils, some oils like like to be mixed at different ratios than others. Especially injector oils versus premix oils, AMS oil versus HP2 versus uh, Penzol Marine. They all have different ratios. They tend to like to be mixed at. Um, whatever you stick with and you're happy with, be consistent. That is the biggest thing. Everybody asks me, what do you run your helicopter at? I'm not telling you what I run my helicopter at because if, if you're not capable of tuning or not comfortable with tuning, you can damage it if you're not careful. I give recommendations with every engine to run it around 40 to 1 during after break-in time. I get people saying I disagree with you. That's fine. If you can run it richer and it's more comfortable for you and it works for you, then that's fine. If you want to run it leaner and you're capable of tuning it to, to be you know safe, then that's fine. It's, it's all about being consistent with whatever you're running. Uh, we use, we recommend Lone Boy Ashless as our break-in lube. Why? Straight up. This is the stuff that we primarily use as our normal running oil. It's a synthetic. Synthetic oils don't break in very well. It takes a lot longer to do so. So the Lone Boy Ashless, as we call it, liquid sandpaper, helps get their starts the ring seated because it's about a two-gallon process to get the helicopter broken and be safe. It takes a lot longer to get it really happy, but if you stick, if you start with a synthetic, it takes a lot longer to get everything stabilized. You can do it either way, but you're gonna have more of, uh, or more fun doing it, you know, with a, with a mineral oil base. All right, we're gonna talk briefly about the differences between a helicopter that, it, that was designed and made for a gas engine or a helicopter that was made say for nitro or electric that was modified or converted to be a gas engine. How many, just the most popular, is, is there uh, a well-known helicopter of course that was made for a gas engine? I know Miniature Aircraft made the Spectra G Correct. and that was probably a very popular helicopter for gas in those days. They did very well when it was introduced. Uh, also, Century Helicopter makes their Radical line, which is made for gas. They have a, a 600 and a 700. And Bergen RC also has their Intrepid line, which is a 700 class model. I, I know that the, uh, the, the Radical became very popular, relatively speaking, of course, in a short period. And I think that was mainly because what? It was a 50 size. Uh, the original one was like swinging 600 millimeter blade. So The original was a 600, and they shortly after that reduced the produced the 30, which is the 700 class. Okay. They're based on the same frame design, they're very light, and they perform well. As, as I talked about earlier, they're sort of the old school gas helicopter and the new school. And there's a huge difference in performance between the two, because traditionally people use gas helicopters for uh, aerial photography, sport flyers, you know, weekend flyers who just want to goof around with a helicopter, they're not comfortable with glow or electric. They're familiar with gasoline engines because everybody's got a weed eater or something at yeah. home. <laughs> so they, you know, they want the gas helicopter, but they're not going to take it out and do really high performance. What's changed in the last couple of years is both Miniature Aircraft has, is releasing their Whiplash, and Century has their Radical line. These are both very high performance helicopters. They have the ability to be turned at you know, 3D head speeds, 21, 2200 RPMs, where you're going to get a nice pop in the performance. 
and the motors have, have come along, as, as Al talked about, in terms of performance, where you can support that now. So, so basically, the Radical, the most popular ones, the Radical, the Bergen line of heli gas helicopters, and miniature the spectrum. miniature uh, original, or I guess you could say vintage sort of Spectra line, and the new Whiplash. Correct. Um, I'm sure there's probably more made in China or here and there that are really not as popular, especially in the U.S. market. But those are, I guess you could say, the, the three or four main. There, there are other more sort of niche models out there. Mm -hmm. You know, Vario makes one that's, that's really nice. It flies well, very heavy. Uh, not as suited for high performance. It depends More for on, scale or depends on you know it really yeah. depends on your flying style. So and, and traditionally people don't think about using gas helicopters for 3D because of the reasons I outlined. And what you're gonna see going forward, especially with these new motors and the new models, is it's gonna be it's gonna be more acceptable to, to either learn 3D or do most of your 3D training with them simply because it works. And it's far less expensive to operate than you know thirty dollar a gallon glow fuel. Now, I know there's conversions as well. Right. And before we briefly talk about conversions, why would you do a conversion over buying a helicopter that was originally design designed for gas power? Is it because you already have a helicopter and you want to convert it, or is it because there's an advantage to it? Well, there's two re two main reasons. The most prevalent is you already have the donor model and almost all of these are based around T-Rex 600s and 700s. Um, there are two manufacturers of conversions in, in general. One of them is a company out of Texas uh, called Helibug, and Century has now introduced a line called uh, Heli World, uh, or HWC, where they are focused on the T-Rex 600 and 700. Helibug is actually doing conversions for not only the T-Rexes, but they also do them for the TZ line, they do them for the Raptor 90, and they have a conversion that you can actually change the motor in your Spectra to this RC format that, that Alan showed earlier. The big advantage there is it, it cools much better than the original, and you're gonna have a higher performance out of it. So there you have it, guys. Either you buy a helicopter that was originally designed for gas power, or if you have a T-Rex 600 or 700 or a Raptor 90 or any of these helicopters, check out Helibug. What was the name of the other company? Helibug is, it's do you know century. the website? Uh, heli, Helibug.com maybe? We'll Hel put it in the show notes. We'll find it. Helibug.com or Century. And, and then Century, century, heli century heli helicopter. Helicopters. Okay. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Kerry. We'll no move problem. on. One thing that is very important about gas helicopters is how much cheaper it is to run these guys. And this is one of the reasons why they're becoming more and more and more, more popular. Um, I've recently been traveling to like places like Australia and South America and like Europe and I see how these people really complain about the high cost of nitro. Um, a gallon, for example, of nitro in Europe in most places costs fifty, sixty dollars, sometimes seventy dollars, depending on the exchange rate. In the United States, I believe the average price of a gallon of nitro is about thirty dollars. Um, if you think about it, I mean that's that's a lot of money. And generally, on a ninety-size machine or a machine that's spinning seven hundred millimeter blades, you you get about maybe if you're lucky eight minutes about seven tanks per gallon and you're done that's if you do the math that's not more than about 50 to 60 minutes of flying total flying for one gallon if you live in Europe for example and you're paying sixty dollars for a gallon of nitro that's a lot of money If you do the math it costs a lot to run a nitro helicopter these guys right here they actually use a lot less fuel um, I was talking to Kerry and, and Alan and they're basically telling me that if you want the most performance that you can get out of these guys on a helicopter this size, again a 90 size helicopter swinging 700 millimeter blades, you consume about a, an ounce of gasoline um, per minute roughly. So if you do the math, you're getting over two hours of really hardcore 3D with a gas helicopter and in one gallon, you know. So a gallon of gas in the United States is three dollars and fifty cents four dollars depending on what part of the country you live in in Europe a gallon of gasoline if you do the the math is probably about between eight and ten dollars uh, that's still pretty pretty cheap so uh, that's a, that's a huge incentive to get you into gas helicopters if you fly if you do sport flying 
it's a lot cheaper actually. If you do spore flying, you might stretch the two hour fly time to three or even four hours of fly time with one gallon of gasoline. Now, of course, if you're using the Coleman fuel, the Coleman fuel that we showed you earlier, it's a little bit more money, right? About $10 a gallon. This is about $10 a gallon in, in the United States. It's still very cheap. But if you want to save money all the way, you just go to your good old fashioned gas station, uh, get you a jug and just get some regular old, good old fuel and you can do a lot of practice. You could go and fly back to back, back to back with a few receiver packs for hardly any money. I'm sure you would go to, uh, you're probably spending more money on this Smack Talk episode, let's put it that way. Okay, and I'm here with Alan again, Alan Gement. He, uh, he's with TRM Power. And uh, what, what is TRM Power? TRM Power started out back in 96 as Toxic Marine. I uh, primarily did marine race engines, uh, but I always flew helicopters. Uh, a fellow by the name of John Garst back in the early days, him and Will James got me into you know trying to do some gas stuff. And I got hooked on the gas myself and started producing gasoline engines and then realized I can't call my business Toxic Marine any longer, so we changed it to uh, TRM, which stands for Toxic Racing Machines. Now we uh, amped everything up, and now we call it TRM Power. And that's why they call you Toxic Al. Yeah, that's why they call me Toxic Al. It's easier to say that than my last name. So, so in all fairness to, to the viewers and to your competitors, there's another company that does the modifications oh, yeah. as well, right? What, and that's, that's uh, Bruce Hansen owned by Al Cinelli. Okay. And why, why, are they, uh, why are these gas engines having to be modified? Is that necessary? So the guy that is going out there to buy a gas helicopter, he wants to buy the RC version of the, the engine, right? Like we just saw. Okay. And he say he buys a whiplash. Does he have to modify that engine? No, not at all. But here's, here's why you come to guys like myself and Al. The first thing is, let me just, just say that originally power wasn't the main concern that miniature aircraft approached me. It was vibration. Um, these things were just vibing all over the place. Zenoa builds these engines as a specific, here, here you go. Take it or leave it. The problem was is we're now trying to use them in a more specific application that requires some, some finesse. So the vibration was the key factor. Power was just a secondary thing and that was always the key. We always try to make them smooth, both Al and myself. Nowadays, again, since we're really starting to approach the high performance end of the helicopters, not even just the motors, but the helicopters themselves, you, 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 can't, you can't take a Ferrari and put a four cylinder out of a Corolla in it and expect it to perform. It's not going to work. I know that's a weird analogy, but it's something that, that I can explain. The, I'm going to give you the whiplash, you know, for instance. Chris Lund and I talked about it, and they said the first thing we're going to do is we're going to put a stock engine in it. Chris I Lund said, is one of the designers correct, of the whiplash. Correct. For all of you that uh, him and Bobby. Yeah. And uh, I said, that's perfect. You always have to use a baseline. He calls me back up. He says, man, this thing just is not got it. I said, okay, so you tell me what you want, and then we'll, we'll go from there. And I don't know if anybody's seen the video uh, at Ursha, Bobby flying it and Beast flying it. That was my new, uh, which hasn't even been released on the market yet. It's called uh, the, the VX260 or 270TT or turbo tune motor. Uh, and that is our newest version of a high performance application for the whiplash. Um, that motor is tuning right now at about 14,500 RPMs. And the biggest thing everybody's like, that's oh, turning too high, it's turning too much. These engines were designed to turn 15,000 plus RPMs right out of the box. My marine engines are running at over 19,000 in certain occasions. So reliability is not a problem, again, if they're tuned correctly. But the, the key factor is, is I'm building you a product that is specifically set up for that product. It is an application issue. You want a 3D helicopter? You got a 3D helicopter. Now you're gonna have to put the power and the RPMs that are gonna that'll make it do what it does. Yeah. And that's the main reason. That's the main why. reason why I modify. Correct. So, and people can just basically go to your website and yes. purchase the engine already Correct. modified from you, or uh, people buy the engine and send it to you? What's the best thing two, to do? There's two different ways of doing it. Uh, my main distributor is uh, uh, is Esprit Models, and okay. they, they carry my engines. Um, again, right now, the new motor's not listed on either my website uh, or with them yet, because we haven't released it yet. Uh, but they can do go to Esprit. Uh, model.com yeah. or you can go to my website trmpower.com you can email me uh, you can ask me any question you want I have no problems I'll talk to you for days on stuff uh, I'm full of useless information uh, and the other <laughs> option again century helicopters is also carrying my PUH, PUH motors uh, for the radical series 
Uh, the new motors are going to be carried hopefully uh, soon. Here we're getting ready to do the, the whiplash uh, situation and uh, when that comes out I'll be tickled to death because I'm really really impressed with the new setup. I, I think everybody's just going to absolutely love it. Cool. So for people that just want like a basic helicopter that don't care about 3D, okay. can they still buy a regular gas engine and get away with it? Here's the, or, here's the problem with yeah. that um, and you might see it in the nitro side, I don't know. The consistency between manufacturing or quality control is lacking in, 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 in certain aspects. I'm not saying the Zenoa is not a good engine. It's, it's actually the far best engine out there right now. But the problem is, is just with anything, the more you manufacture stuff, there are variants. And there are variances between everything. I see it on everything I do. When I build engines, I take crankshafts, pistons, and I weigh everything. And there are variances between all of them. I have to bring everything into spec. And when I do that, that's how I can come with a very consistent, reliable engine. And is that, is that the reason why that's happening? Is it because these engines are primarily well, I mean, it's designed for RC, I guess, but isn't really a wee block air engine. I mean, is it? So they really, the manufacturer really is not that picky when it comes to making sure the tolerances are exact and all these things are happening. There are certain tolerances they're right on the money on, yeah. and there's certain things that they're not. But they're not, yeah, yeah. And, and that's where we run into problems. The biggest problem is crankshafts. Yeah. Uh, and there's such a variance in weight. Um, the first thing I do when I take one out is out of the box, I throw it on a trolling stand. I got to make sure things true, and we got to keep them within. I, I send them out less than a thousandth of an inch, um, and I've seen them up to five thousandths of an inch out right out of the box. You can't do that. You know, you you got a you got a shaft coming out and a clutch on that. Actually, a fan hub and, and then a, and then a clutch. And that thing's moving. Yeah, too I mean, much vibration, way too much and vibration. it causes tuning problems. Oh, I'm big sure. time. Big so time. good. So if you have any questions about modifying your engine, this is the man that can help you out. Check him out. TRM. Uh, power.com power trmpower.com okay we're going to talk about uh, fundamental differences in uh, how to set up your gas powered helicopter mainly compare it to to a nitro powered helicopter i was talking to Kerry earlier and he was telling me that the setup is basically the same when you think about it there really nothing changes here in terms of how you set up your servos and your ccpm Kerry's flying the futaba uh, CGY750 flabberless system sets up the same way, same practically everything. And this is the Helibug conversion for the T-Rex 600N, correct? Yeah, this is a Helibug 600 conversion. Uh, it comes with everything you need to convert it except the, the donor model. And basically you need the, the rotor head, the drivetrain, and the entire tail boom assembly, as well as the radio tray. The other pieces bolt around the motor, if you will. It's really not very hard to convert. Uh, it's it's fairly straightforward to put together. In fact, all the conversions are. So um, once you buy this conversion, you buy the engine, say you buy it from, I don't know, Toxic Al, for example, a modified engine or whatever, you bolt it on. I mean, w once the engine is in the helicopter and you got your basic setup of your servos and your throttle right here and everything else, how do you, how do you plumb this thing around? Like, I'm seeing a lot of fuel lines going yeah. on here. I, I know that on a nitro you get the power, you get the, you need to create some sort of pressure for fuel delivery and you either have a regular uh, aspirated nitro engine that uses muffler pressure or you have one of the new modern ones that use either crankcase pressure like a YS or OS HCR or you use a, uh, a pump. Right. How, how does this create pressure? So interestingly this is not that different from the YS or the new OS system. The carburetor has a regulator in it which is under this side of it. And it also has a um, a fuel pump that actually built in, huh? it's built-in fuel pump. It runs off crankcase pressure, just like a YS or OS, and it pulls the fuel into this. There's reservoirs inside here, and it actually regulates the amount of fuel through a pretty complex system as to what goes into the motor. As Bert said, the setup on the model is it's really not is yeah. really not any different. What is very different is the throttle curves. The throttle curve is much lower. You're typically going to want to hover this thing with about a 30% uh, setting on, the, on your center stick. Oh, wow. Now, okay. on the extremes, you're still going up to 100%, but the whole thing is slid further down. Otherwise, this thing will turn you know, 3,000 Too high RPM. on RPM. So basically, if you hover at 3 quarter stick, you're going to be at 30% at 3 quarter stick. Yeah. And if you're not using a governor, when you reach your idle up curves, you're going to be like 100 
30 or below and 100, right? Right, right. yeah, it's, it's kind of strange looking curve if you're not using a governor. So what, what are all these lines for? I can see this is the fuel intake, right? Now actually this oh, is... Oh, this is the this is air? What? The, the fuel comes in right here. I'm a total ignorant here. And this is a fuel return because the way this works is it has a primer bulb on it. And when you first put the fuel in here, you sit here and pump this primer bulb until it pulls the fuel through the carburetor and then the overflow goes back to the tank. Oh, once, I see. once that happens, that doesn't really do anything anymore. Some people just dump it straight out to the ground. But I see. In being uh, environmentally friendly, I push it back. To push the it tank. back into the tank, and it's probably very little fuel, right? There's very yeah. little fuel. It's hardly anything. The other thing you have to have is a is a vent, because again, it's a negative pressure system, so you're pulling fuel out of the tank. If yeah. you don't put some sort of vent on it, this is a one-way valve. Yeah, Most so it only lets air in. It only uh, lets air in. Some people wrap it in a in a coil, yeah. just a piece of uh, tubing in a coil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One, just one thing to note about this: you cannot use standard silicon fuel tubing. You have to use something that's gas resistant. Yeah. This is called Tigon. Uh, you can also use neoprene. Uh, either one of those. Will yeah. Work. Don't don't use the typical fuel line you use with your low helicopter. It will melt. It will melt. You have to use this different. Uh, type of fuel line. So interesting. Finally, um, if people that uh, want high performance, they obviously don't want to run a throttle curve, they want to run a governor. Right. Um, you know, I know that there's many different ways to use a governor, but I think I read or I heard years back that there was something called a stator gator. Does that still exist? And yes. what does it do? Yes, it does. And this is the, the stator gator unit right here. What it really is, it's a pickup. The other end of this wire goes to the magneto on the motor. The, okay. It actually go, connects to the ground wire on the magneto. And goes, then it comes through here. It goes into this unit and what it's really doing is just passing the RPM pulses back to your governor through a standard wire. To the governor it looks like any other sensor. And what governor are you using here? Is it, It's the one that's built into the 750, it, it's correct? It's built into the yeah, 750, right, here. right. So can you use that with, do you happen to know, you might not know because I know you're a Futaba guy, but do you know if that works with the RevMax governor? It, it works with the TJ RevMax for sure. It okay. also works with the GV1, the 701, and obviously the 750. So it'll work with a Spectrum uh, RevMax governor built into a spectrum uh, oh, yeah, receiver sure. and stuff like that. That's yeah, cool. it, it's all dependent on the governor itself. It doesn't care about the radio. So, so if you want a governor, you need do you need the stator gator or can you run a magnet old fashioned the old fashioned way like we used to do? You can still use the magnet sensors that come with them if you want to. This is just a lot simpler yeah. because it plugs into the motor. There's no magnets to fall apart. Well, you know, some of the sensor cases yeah, yeah, yeah. fall apart. Yeah, it's things. like on the nitro stuff with the new Spectrum backplate sensor that you guys are probably familiar with. You don't no longer have to worry about magnets coming off and 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 sensors just not reading properly. You just plug your sensor into the backplate. Same here. Just. It's set up your stator gator and you're good to go. Is there any anything else out there that's similar to the stator gator or is this the device to Sta have? Stator gator is the only one on the market right now that's wow. doing that. Wow, cool. Awesome. Well, thanks for the tips, Carrie. No problem. All right, we're, before we talk about uh, tuning in, in, in specific, I want to talk about uh, sort of the differences in carburetors in general. This is the carburetor off one of these motors. Interestingly, uh, in some ways it's not that different. It has a fuel pump, it has a regulator, it also has two needles. It has a low speed setting and a high speed setting. It has a uh, butterfly just like in your GLOW model. And in some cases, some of them have a choke which makes it easier to start. Um, the throttle arm is not that different than you'd find on a GLOW model. It simply turns the butterfly uh, which which handles the throttle part of it. We talked about earlier in the plumbing, this is where the fuel comes in. This is the overflow from the priming system and that covers the carburetor. Okay, we're going to give you a very quick and dirty sort of explanation as to how you need to go about tuning your nitro, uh, your gas engine correction. And we did an episode about nitro engine tuning uh, last year, a couple of years ago. And we talked for over 45 minutes about nitro engine tuning 
Of course, we don't have that kind of time. We only have about five minutes to do this. This could be an episode of its own, uh, showing people how to tune these engines. Oh, yeah. um, like with any other engine, tuning is sort of an art more than a science. Um, one thing that I want to say before I give it to, to Kerry and, and Alan is the fact that uh, with, the, with the gas engine, you have no smoke. Uh, under some circumstances you do, but for the most part you don't have anywhere near the amount of smoke you have on your nitro helicopter. And I know that a lot of you guys are used to seeing the smoke and, and using the smoke as a telltale sign of whether the engine is rich or lean. You don't have that here. So you have to be a good tuner and you have to keep, keep a few thing in, things in mind. Um, what, what are the signs or symptoms, first signs or symptoms that an engine is rich, a gas engine? You'll, you'll hear the term four cycling a lot. Uh, the motor will have a tendency to sound like a chainsaw that's kind of like bogged down. That bah, it won't have a very clean, smooth run. Okay. Uh, you can get a lot of tail kick, uh, especially if they're too rich. The motor's struggling to be, to be run clean. Uh, and that's because the motor is sending some sort of, the, the, the gyro is, is, is grabbing, receiving, back. receiving yeah. some of these. Yeah, but by primarily, I, I tell everybody, you know, unless you're really good at tuning, the first thing to really do is set it rich. Uh, it's not going to hurt anything, but what it's going to do is that it's give you a nice, cool temperature to run the engine so everything gets acclimated and happy. Uh, after we go through a gallon procedure of our normal break-in oil, we switch to our, our, our synthetic, uh, and then we'll break it a little bit more, and then we start to tune it in to make it more happy and get some more power out of it and get it so it's running nice and smooth. What are the sign, signs or the symptoms of an engine that is too lean? Uh, when, when you get a too lean, you'll have a surging kind of condition. You can actually get almost like a detonation kind of sound, like a, a knocking going on in there. Uh, a lot of times, you, the power will sag. And what we mean by that is you'll have a situation where you'll be doing a maneuver and it'll be fine, but then all of a sudden you go back into that maneuver and then it just, brrr, the motor's just not having that power anymore. It's getting hot. It's getting lean and it, it, can't, it cannot do what it needs to do. Uh, the problem is, as I said before, a nitro, no big deal. You land, you land it, you rich it back up, you go back up and do it. We don't have the oil content. Uh, we're making a lot more heat than the, the nitro is because you can only do that a couple times before you're going to hurt something. Before you something. hurt it. Yeah. And then when you start leaning or richening, how many, is it like nitro where you only really are working with a couple of clicks at a time? Well, there are no clicks. Okay. okay. We well, don't yeah, have a click. Course. Well, well but, that, that makes a difference. Yeah. Usually, you know, the, with the nitro, you got the little click indicator. You can go in a couple of clicks at a time. We don't have that. So we usually use a, like a blade width, like a 16th of a turn, you know, eighth of a turn, quarter of a turn, uh, you know, to get started. Um, and, and each, I don't care what anybody tells you, every helicopter is going to be different. Uh, we're in Florida right now, it's about 80 something degrees and we have low humidity today, but you might go and I talked to Chris Lund a lot, and they're over in Montana. Well, they're at 4,000 elevation uh, as far as the... Uh, uh, oh yeah, totally different. Totally different. So your needle settings are never going to be the same from one area to the next, but there are certain guidelines that you can go by uh, that it's going to help you get it tuned in. Always start rich and work your way in. You don't want to go the other way out. Yeah. And the biggest thing is your spark plug. Spark plug color tells you a very, very, very uh, in-depth detail of what's going on. We're going to show a close-up of the glow uh, spark plug. Now later. this one is actually not what you want to see. This is on the cusp of being too lean. You'll see if you can get good detail, the insulator is actually yellow or a goldish color. What you're looking for uh, in a properly tuned setup is a chocolate brown, a milk chocolate, just like a milk, uh, like a Hershey bar, a nice milk chocolate brown. If it's darker and it's running good for you, then leave it alone, then you're safe. But if you're gonna try to get the optimum amount of power, you're gonna wanna be in a nice milk chocolate brown. You start getting into the yellows and you start getting into uh, what we call the grays. Uh, you lean, too lean is way too lean and when it starts showing gray, you're under stress. So yeah. you, need to, you need to slant it and richen it up. I tell people that when they're tuning a helicopter for the first time or getting through the break-in procedure, every tank full, let it cool down, check your plug. It's gonna tell you what's going on. Let's go ahead and fly this helicopter very briefly here. Um, just to give you an idea how, how a gas engine should sound like. And this engine is tuned right, correct? That's perfect. And you could do commentary as I'm flying it, um, you know, and, and Sean will get the helicopter on the, on the camera. Now you'll see right now, there's a little bit of smoke coming out of it. That's normal, especially after sitting and idling for the whole time, it's gonna load up a little bit. But you'll see it start to dissipate, especially once he starts going into maneuvers.
Now you can hear that basically the helicopter itself is not changing pitch. What I mean by that is the motor itself is consistently doing the same thing. You're going to hear it load down through the pitch changes, but the motor comes right back to its initial sound. Nice, clean, and even. And this is the uh, Helibug conversion on the uh, T-Rex Nitro 600. This is Carrie's helicopter. He was kind enough to let me fly it. I'm sure he's a little bit nervous right now. That's why I'm taking it easy on it. Plus, it's a different setup, different radio, different everything. But as you can see, this helicopter is pulling really good. I remember flying gassers a long time ago that barely had any power. This thing can do like TikToks, no problem. And you can hear the motor load a little bit, but it, as it loads, it still pulls through the maneuvers. And by the way, I told Carrie to increase the pitch for me. And we don't know for real how much pitch I'm running, but I'm sure I'm running a lot of pitch, probably in excess of 12 or thir maybe 13. So I'm using quite a bit of collective management. And just to let, just to interject something, yeah. the motor that you're running right now is not a prototype anymore. That's just not on the website. That is a, believe it or not, a two. That's a two two thirty. That is the RC two thirty TT motor, uh, which is a twenty three or twenty two and a half cc engine, um, and it's specifically set up for this application. But one of the things you had mentioned, and I would like to point that out, is there's a difference between bogging an engine and loading an engine. And what yes. you're doing is loading the motor, not bogging it. And a, way, a good way to tell that is when you back off the collective, it comes right back to where it was. That is a load capability, not a bog. That is correct. And I told that to my uh, viewers also on my uh, nitro tuning episode because when the engine is when a nitro engine is lean and you load it, it doesn't really come back from it. It's more of a bog. Um, so that quick recovery, it's, it's a telltale sign on a nitro engine that the motor is not lean. Is that the same on the gas engines? Yes, same and, thing. And uh, as I showed before, if I do something to load it, I'm going to load it really hard on purpose. Immediately comes back. That's and it. it's, it's a nice and crisp, you know, healthy sound. Well, just like with anything, you can, you know, depending on your ability, uh, one of the things that gas is, you guys have always said this, is it definitely teaches you collective management, uh, but you can load anything. In nitro, you can knock it down out of its power just by not being able to control your collective. Another thing that's key to the performance you're seeing is to make sure that you've got the right gear ratio combined with the right motor the right exhaust system and the right set of blades. Historically what happens with these is people just kind of get, you know, whatever they want to get. They don't really put a lot of thought or, or expertise into combining the parts. And just like with Nitro Electric, it's very important to have the right combination of motor, exhaust, gear ratio, and blade size for a given model. Because just like with the Nitro or Electric, you can get poor performance out of it. That's the biggest thing that we see and we get, you know, most, most people don't understand is that these motors are not specifically set up for every application, just like the helicopter's not. You've got to gear it correctly in order to get what you want out of it. And if you have a motor that's built for the wrong gearing or for the wrong RPM for that gearing, you're never going to get the performance that you're looking for. That is very true. Bert's doing a little bit of lawn maintenance. So I hope this is a good explanation on how to tune. Of course, like I said, we could go for hours on this subject. But uh, one last question. What's the fuel pickup that you guys recommend on high performance applications on nitro? We always recommend going with a, uh, going back into normal mode so the engine isn't too, uh, the engine dropped down pretty quick. Um, what do you recommend for fuel pickup? We recommend like a fuel magnet, for example, on nitro applications. Um, what do you recommend on, on, the, uh, on the gas application? What I particularly use and, and recommend is actually made by Walbro. Uh, it is their pickup uh, that comes actually with the RC motor. It is a felt 
over over a little zinc block uh, that allows you to uh, have a good weighted clunk, but it also filters the fuel as it's coming through. And it does one other thing. You guys will hear that sometimes you'll get a foaming situation going in the tank. This will kind of strain that out. You won't have the air bubbles getting through your line because uh, that can cause you to go have a lean out condition and flame out in the air. So that's and not the, a good and thing. And the, the foam could be a symptom of vibration. Yes. It could be a symptom of engine that is lean. It can be a symptom of engine is lean. Something's not tuned correctly. Yeah. In, in the setup there's a number of different factors that can cause it uh, and again as you said before that's something that we can talk about for uh, yeah, yeah. another situation. Yeah we could spend an hour and a half doing that. Thanks a lot guys. Not I a think problem. That was, that was a great segment. Appreciate it. Awesome. So here I have Carrie's T-Rex 600 again. This is the 600 Nitro. Uh, convert it with the heli bug conversion and I'm just going to fly it for a couple two three minutes and talk to you about the way it feels to me as I fly it. It's a different radio, it's a different setup. I'm really not used to it, so I'm gonna kinda take it easy on it. Just do some basic maneuvers and stuff. And I'm gonna talk about how it compares to nitro power as I do them. One of the huge advantages of nitro, of gas helicopters, is the fact that these machines are great um, for, as learning machines because the power is not huge, so it actually forces you to learn your collective management. Now as you can see, like you were looking at, we were seeing earlier when we were doing the uh, tuning segment, the motor will load. If you're really drastic and aggressive with it, you can kill the motor, like that. But as you can see, it recovers very quickly. So, and you know, if you know how to do your collective management, you can do all kinds of maneuvers. It just looks a little slower than when you fly the, uh, the nitro or the electric. You can't really make sudden, drastic, sudden changes in direction. But look at that. You can do like fast tail down TikToks. You just got to kind of manage your collective. So you can do basically every single maneuver. This is actually a lot of fun to fly. It's, uh, it's, it's also because of the, a little bit less power that they have, it actually kind of forces you to slow things, things down, which is really good for practice. I know a lot of people that they're practicing or they're trying to learn something and they actually like, just they're too uh, aggressive. And the more aggressive you become and the faster you try to fly, the more difficult the flying gets. With this thing, you're actually kind of forced to, to take it easy on it. And that actually helps tremendously when it comes to thinking about the maneuvers you're doing, thinking about the maneuver you're gonna do next, and so forth. You can see it just does all the maneuvers in the book. Really cool machine.
Now the only thing that you're not going to like about a gas helicopter is the fact that they're not going to auto as well as your normal helicopter, nitro or electric, simply because they're heavy. Now however, you can see this thing is still autoing pretty decent. I mean, I had enough energy at the bottom, it wasn't anything crazy, but uh, it was just enough to practice autos. And actually it might even help you also without autos, just because it doesn't have that crazy left out energy at the end of the auto. So. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this uh, episode. This was number 19 where we talked about gas helicopters. I want to personally thank Kerry Shirley. Nope, no problem. You're welcome. Um, that was very kind of him uh, to bring all his machines and, of course, for both of them, including Al. Thanks a lot, Al. Appreciate it. Hey, man, Bert, it was my pleasure. So if you have any questions, like they said before, Kerry is always open to answer questions. He's very knowledgeable with gas helicopters. We're dealing with the South Florida, Central Florida wind. Uh, uh, Alan here is open to questions uh, like you said before his website is trmpower.com uh, he'll be more than happy to assist you if you have any questions about getting an, a, hel a, a new gas engine or a modified engine or what have you so thanks again guys yeah go ahead. I also host a forum on HeliFreak called Gas Powered Thoughts uh, you can get to it either from HeliFreak or you can just go to gaspoweredthoughts.com and it'll take you there we talk about uh, all sorts of subjects including some deep dives. We've actually drilled apart carburetors and things like that. So there's some good information there. Awesome, there you have it. So um, go to Heli Freak, check out the gas forum that Kerry's taking care of and uh, another forum, which one is it under, called differently? It's actually under the gas forum sub forum. It's just TRM Power. TRM Power, there you go. So there's a lot of resources. And again, at the very end of the show here, within the next few seconds, we're gonna put up a bunch of URLs of useful resources that you can check out um, if you want to get started with gas helicopters. So thanks again, Kerry. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Al. Yep. See you guys next time. Extremely well, it's just a preference. You're gonna find it. It's gonna go for my, for me, from the RC, and uh, stop there for a second because I just screwed, totally screwed that up. Okay. Uh, you buy this, and it gives you the side frames, the motor mount. Like you're basically probably only using what the head, the tail. Uh, really changed the performance of them. They're good. We'll use that. Anyway, you're rolling, right? You're rolling, rolling. All right. No, you hold on to that. You have to. Oh God, this wind is wild. You have to pass it to him when he's going to talk and kind of keep it really close. Okay. All right, you're on? Hello, hello, hello. Hello? All right, you ready? Ready? We'll wait for Pete. Do that again? And then we'll do and then we'll do another, I'll, I'll kind of do it like as a credit thing or scrolls. Okay. So heli manufacturer. There are variances. You could buy a perfectly brand new motor out of the box and it's going to run fine. You might buy one that's going to shake like hell. Yeah. Is that a good way? Unless yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, we can say shit and hell. It's fine. I'm sorry. It's good. Okay. Well, you don't want it to shake. So the problem is it's a crapshoot. Um, that's the difference. What? <laughs> I'm just... It's, it's, it's a crapshoot. You never know what you're going to get.